Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming tonight. My name is Prescott Herzog, and I'm a 25 from Claremont, New Hampshire. Uh, this summer, I had the opportunity to witness firsthand the work of Dr. Zaidi and the Biden-Harris administration as a public engagement intern in the White House's Council of Environmental Quality. And from making it easier for houses of worship to attain solar panels for remo to removing every lead pipe in America in the next 10 years, the Biden-Harris administration has made historical progress in fighting the climate crisis and building up our country's middle class. From historic flooding to early apple farm freezes, we're already seeing the effects of climate crisis here in the Upper Valley. And the climate investments Dr. Zaidi and the Biden-Harris administration have pushed ensure that our communities won't just get by, but get ahead through our nation's climate policy. I now would like to turn it over to Dr. Melody Brown Birkins. Thank you, Prescott. Um, let me welcome all of you here online and in your chairs. And before I open this event, I did want to say, um, and we'll introduce our speakers, a few short marks. I wanted a quick note of thanks to Prescott um, for bringing these guests here to Dartmouth. He actually made the invitation. Thank you. Um, and to, in the background, you may not know, there's Katie Schlick, Diego Nunez, Sana Siddiqui, Rachel Kent, Sharon Tribu, Sam Martan, and so many others who put all of this together and had this event um, for tonight. Um, my thanks to everyone here for your time. One thing I wanted to note is that you have note cards on tables with pens and pencils, I believe. And during this event, we hope you will write down some questions um, that come to you. And somewhere maybe around, I guess, 7, 705, somewhere in there, if you could pass them down to this end. And we're going to try to find a few that we can uh, do the audience Q&A and I could, we can find a few that to ask. It's just so, so overwhelming. We wanted to make sure we had a few to, to, to go through. Um, so that will happen maybe 705 or so. We'll try to get you to put those down to the end. And they will be the questions that are part of what I ask uh, Mr. Zadie and Ms. Sittenfeld. And I'm about to introduce those. But first, I'm Melody Brown Birkins. <laughs> I'm the director of the Institute of Arctic Studies and the senior associate director in the John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding. And you're sitting in one of our uh, convening spaces. I'm a proud also graduate school alumna of Dartmouth. I graduated in 98 with my master's degree, well, 95 master's degrees. Uh, degree, 98 PhD in Earth, Environmental and Climate Sciences, quite a long time ago. And I'm so honored to be directing the Institute of Arctic Studies, which is a longstanding and distinctive institute at Dartmouth that has not only brought Arctic issues to the campus um, across the disciplines since 1989, but has ensured that our continued engagement in the Arctic always centers Arctic peoples, thus Arctic indigenous peoples, Arctic communities, as we think about climate solutions. And the Dickey Center for International Understanding that you're sitting here is, is another unique and amazing distinctive place at Dartmouth. I wanted to say this is where we bring the international world to Dartmouth and send students out into the world. We try to bring diverse perspectives here and have convening dialogues to think about the great issues of our day. Um, and we were named actually after uh, John Sloan Dickey, uh, former Dartmouth president, when he said, he said, the world's troubles are your troubles and there is nothing wrong with the world that better human beings cannot fix. So that's what we hope to do here is that we hope to make a place where we talk about the issues, we think about how we can come together, we work with communities around the world and we find solutions for a better planet and better lives for all of us. So recognizing that one of the great shared challenges we face and troubles is rapid climate change, and it is up to all of us to engage on these solutions. It is my honor and privilege to be hosting the White House National Climate Advisor and Assistant to the President, Mr. Ali Zaidi, here today. He plays a key and pivotal role, perhaps the pivotal role, in leading our nation's transition to a more affordable, equitable, reliable, and low carbon energy future, serving as the lead for the White House Climate Policy Office and our national implementation of the Biden administration's climate policy and strategy. He has a distinguished career in law, public policy, and climate advocacy, and he has brought this wealth of experience and his unwavering commitment to addressing the global climate, climate crisis in the halls of our executive branch and our legislative branch. He is so kindly here with us today on a campus where the entire community, faculty, students, and staff have an opportunity to implement our own climate solution with Dartmouth President Bylock's vision for a decarbonized institution that will, we hope will show 60% reductions of our greenhouse gases by 2030. And his leadership is welcome here today where he and his colleague 
and a Dartmouth alumna, uh, Tiernan Sittenfeld, class of 96, are here to talk with students, with faculty, and senior leaders about climate change. So Mr. Zaidi's uh, leadership includes being central, I should say, to the whole implementation, uh, implementation of the Biden administration's ambitious climate agenda over the past four years, work that has committed the US to achieving net zero carbon emissions in our nation by 2050 and accelerating clean energy transitions. He has focused on climate justice in under under resourced communities and um, those who are often uh, overlooked in spaces where we try to make decisions and don't take it into account the communities that are actually being impacted the worst the most by climate change. And he was he comes to this work from uh, quite a long history of 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 work of, of understanding different parts of the world. He was born in Pakistan and raised in the United States, just side, outside of Erie, Pennsylvania. One of my students was very clear that that was an important place because they went to rival high schools, I believe. And his lived experience has shaped his understanding of environmental justice and the need for these equitable climate solutions. He is a graduate of Harvard University and Georgetown Law, received, received and has combined this work, uh, his work in academia with a career dedicated to creating and supporting positive investments in environmental policy and sustainable transitions. Um, I will also give a quick, uh, I wanted to give a quick note to, we have, as I said, uh, an alumna of Dartmouth, the 96, who uh, happily took us through, we went through the Orozco, we had to go look at that. We went through Sanborn. She was very proud to show Mr. <laughs> Sanborn, was not tea today, unfortunately, but, um, Tiernan brings an incredible, uh, incredible career to Dartmouth uh, from Dartmouth as well. She is the senior vice president of government affairs at the League of Conservation Voters and directs the League of Conservation Voters policy and lobbying efforts with Congress and the executive branch on a range of issues from climate change to energy, public lands, water, and chemical policy reform. She works in the League of Conservation's legislative account accountability campaigns and oversees the National Environmental Scorecard. We learned today in class how much she works closely with climate change champions throughout the executive branch, including uh, Mr. Zaidi and, the Biden and those in the Biden administration. She also leads the League of Conservation's Action Fund coordinated team and oversees candidate endorsements and endorsement communications. Um, so with this group, we're going to talk today about climate, uh, we're going to talk today about climate action in a conversation again for your, 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 um, and have your input. But before that, I'm sorry, but I went with the wrong, my, my, my notes got a little bit concerned, but I will just go with, I'll go, they didn't print out correctly, but I will say, um, first, we're going to hear a little bit from uh, um, the climate advisor Zadie, and he has a presentation to show us that we'll walk through, and then we'll move to a conversation here. I'm going to ask a few questions, and then again, have a few questions from the group that I would like to put in front of them. So, as I said to my class earlier today, this is such an opportunity to have these folks on campus. Thank you for being here. I'm going to turn the podium over um, with my lack of obvious notes to Mr. Zadie. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's absolutely wonderful to be here at Dartmouth and I think we'll get Oh, uh, open the there you go. There we go. Not the technology advisor, folks. Um, <laughs> uh, really, we gather um, at a remarkable moment. The United States has made tremendous progress on climate change um, just over the last few years. Um, if you rewind the clock, to 2019, the United Nations IPCC, the panel of climate scientists declared this the decisive decade for climate action. And it's not easy, uh, especially as our hearts and minds turn to folks in Florida and across the Southeast. Um, this is heavy work, it's hard work. And the case I'm hoping to lay out to all of you is notwithstanding all of the doom and gloom, notwithstanding the impacts of climate change that we've already unleashed, there's actually a lot of reason to not just keep accelerating progress, um, but do it in a way that makes folks feel hopeful about 
the possibilities and opportunities in front of us. Um, this administration, uh, I think, has taken a uh, unusual approach to climate change. Um, while we've done uh, so much to gird our infrastructure and our communities uh, to those impacts, um, investing over $50 billion into the resilience of our communities, I think the insight from President Biden, Vice President Harris, was to locate action on climate with action on the economy, to tie these two together uh, and recognize that this really is the moment where conscience and convenience in economic terms uh, are crossing and to lean into that. So it's a strategy that's focused, again, not on the doom and gloom, but on the opportunity that's in front of us. And to make that have meaning for people, uh, it's really contoured around three primary objectives. The first is a focus on places. Uh, we have communities all across America, and you might have driven by one of these idled uh, plants or factories that have been shuttered where the fence seems to uh, box the loss of opportunity in uh, and keep opportunity uh, from showing up. Our task in delivering a different approach to climate action has been to reach those places in particular. And of course, it's not just about revitalizing the places, it's about lifting up people who felt left behind. As you look at the history of our economic booms over the last many decades, there are whole groups of folks that have felt like that prosperity just slid right over them, uh, that they didn't have a chance to tap in to the transformation. One of the things we've been able to do, I think successfully under President Biden, Vice President Harris leadership, is to focus in particular on disadvantaged communities, on those people left out. And we've literally built the map uh, to focus the effort um, and really worked to hone uh, our agencies into an accountability framework that does it. And then the third, I think, central element to the opportunity-focused approach to climate is actually building projects. You know, it's really easy if you go around the country and tell people uh, these pie-in-the-sky plans of how everything's going to be great. Um, it's easy to say it's very hard to buy. <laughs> But folks are more receptive if you can actually deliver projects. And one of the, I think, shifts that President Biden, Vice President Harris have driven is this shift in the environmental consensus to focus on building the solutions that we so desperately need in our communities. And we've driven all of this through an all-in, all-of-government approach that has harmonized two really powerful sets of tools. The first set of tools is the one that's written about most frequently. Uh, this is the Landmark Inflation Reduction Act legislation, the world's largest investment in climate and clean energy technology. The Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, which funds things like poles and wires and the charging network, the connective tissue to enable the clean energy economy to take off. But what's I think underappreciated is the architecture of the standards that actually create the demand and the regulatory certainty to accelerate capital formation in this space. And one of the most visible places where you see it is in the transportation sector, where both the Department of Transportation and the EPA have moved to set standards all the way out to 2032 that make it easier for a investor or a company to plan where they want to put their capital. And it makes it easier for the workforce to train up and meet the demand. And part of, I think, achieving the moment has been to focus not just on one part of where the emissions come from or another part, but to take in the opportunity in every sector of the economy. Now, I won't run through each line item, but I want you to 
take away this recognition that when we think about climate action, we should be thinking about power and transportation and heavy industry and buildings, land, agriculture, waters, and of course, the cross-cutting investments we need to make in environmental justice, the work of repair, and in resilience. So the result of this approach, one which leans into the economic opportunity, one which harmonizes the tools of government standard setting and catalytic public investment, and one that takes on the opportunity in every sector of the economy is an unprecedented boom in American manufacturing, a real renaissance that breaks decades of uh, disinvestment in our industrial capacity uh, and a real transformation for the United States where it has become from a laggard in private investment uh, into the clean energy manufacturing sector, the place for the world to drive that investment. And the transformation, this goes back to the places, the people, the projects. This is how it shows up on the ground. I went to Dalton, Georgia, uh, where they used to be the carpet making factory of the world. Those jobs went away and with it, a sense of pride and a sense of dignity and a paycheck. Those factories that had been abandoned now are the places where a new solar industry is standing up. Dalton, the place where we're making more solar than anywhere else in America. And I went there recently and saw the Earth Day artwork uh, from uh, the young kids who are the children of the workers at the Dalton, Georgia facility. And they paint their parents, not just as folks manufacturing solar, but as superheroes. So it's a restoration, not just of economic activity, but of a sense of pride and place and purpose. And we see that story in Toledo, Ohio, where there was a brownfield. Now there is a world-class steel facility producing steel cleaner than we would have uh, imported. Or in Berlin, New Mexico, where I went with the vice with the president, um, there used to be a solo cup factory. You guys know what that is here at Dartmouth, right? <laughs> uh, and uh, and that obviously manufacturing went away. They are repurposing that factory as the place where they are manufacturing components for the wind industry, union workers at the front of it. So that opportunity is now cascading through the entire economy and it reaches places folks never imagined it would in just a few years, including in the agriculture sector where 80,000 farms now are signed up for climate smart agriculture practices. That's 75 million acres. And we're on a trajectory by just the end of this decade uh, to have more than a quarter of the farms and ranches in the United States enlisted in this important work, engaging minority serving institutions, engaging community colleges. And that enlistment uh, of the entire economy and everybody in it facilitates, I think, a sense of buy-in to the scale of action we're taking on uh, that's essential to meeting the size of the challenge. Now, even as we level the playing field, bring everybody in, there's an important part of the climate equation, which is to also look backwards, uh, to do the hard work of repair. That's why environmental justice has been a big focal point for the investment agenda in this administration. And I'll give you one example. There are a bunch up here. If you look across the country, the impact of extreme heat is literally felt more pronounced in communities that were historically redlined. The legacy of racist housing policy is now felt in the impacts of climate change that fall disproportionately across the country. That's why we're undertaking a billion and a half dollar investment, the largest ever undertaken in the United States. And we're focusing that tree planting bringing that cover and canopy to the communities that are feeling the heat the most. So we've boomed a new clean energy economy. U.S. manufacturing in is, is in renaissance. And the focus of all of this expansion is from the bottom up. 
and the middle out, which I think is the most durable way to build climate action. So I'll give you a few specific examples. The first is offshore wind, just to give you a sense of where we are. Before this administration took office, we had zero offshore wind farms of the utility scale that have been permitted on our coasts. Since then, we've permitted 10 massive utility scale plants, enough to support 15 gigawatts of offshore wind. All 50 states have part of the supply chain and we're moving forward. Each of these plants, just to give you a sense, there's one that's being built off the coast of Virginia by Dominion Energy with the IBEW as the lead union doing the work. That one plant alone is the size of the Hoover Dam. So we often look backwards and we think, oh, that was the time. The New Deal was the time when we used to imagine big things. But since then, our imagination has shrunk. Just one out of the 10 offshore wind plants is the size of the Hoover Dam. And we're doing multiples of that every day in every part of the energy sector. Think about the solar transformation. Solar was invented here in the United States, Bell Labs. And then for a very long time, it was not made here. In just three and a half years, we've quadrupled the amount of US solar manufacturing capacity, on track to double again by the end of this decade. And we've put up as many solar panels in the last three and a half years as we did in every year before this administration. So we know how to pick up the pace and we know how to make it here in America and batteries is another example of that. Technology where the Nobel Prize went to scientists here in the United States. It was perfected in our national labs at Argonne outside of Chicago. And if you look right here until 2021, basically no capacity to make that stuff here. But we've turned on the engine to use maybe an inapt analogy for this specific example. And not only are we making the batteries here in the United States, we're making the anodes and the cathodes and the separator, and we are producing the lithium to support that production and building a circular economy as part of the clean energy economy. Nuclear is another place where for four decades, we saw no new nuclear coming online. Here, in this administration, we've been able to plug in the first new nuclear plant in Georgia. We have plants that were retired that are coming back to meet the demand. I was just in Michigan a few weeks ago where the plant is coming back to help supply clean energy to two rural cooperatives, the Wolverines and the Hoosiers who have found something they agree on now. Um, and you see it as the United States takes up the baton to lead the next generation of nuclear power and technology innovation. And of course the grid, if there were one scorecard underneath greenhouse gas emissions that I would encourage you to always pay attention to, it's how we're doing on the power decarbonization trajectory. And this is not the scoreboard, but it's a very critical indicator this year, we will add more capacity to the grid than we have in two decades. 97% of that capacity is going to be clean energy. How do we go faster? By building more transmission capability to move those clean electrons from where they're being generated to where they need to go. And to that end, we're deploying new approaches, reconductoring, dynamic line ratings, repurposing existing interconnection, and of course, building 5,000 lines, 5,000 miles of new line. Now, we had this conversation earlier today as well, even as we do all of this work to bend the curve on emissions and think about this, we were on a trajectory to reduce our emissions by 18 to 20% by 2030 at the beginning of this administration. We've doubled that projection in just three and a half years and with five years more to go on the clock, I am very confident we will close the gap and meet our goals. But even with that, even with rallying the whole world as President Biden, Vice President, have, Vice President Harris have been doing, 
we are still behind. And even if we achieve what we must, our one and a half degree ambition globally, we'll still have unleashed some of the impacts we're seeing every single day. To that, we have to bring the climate adaptation and resilience toolkit. So I talked about the $50 billion of investment, but one of the things I'm really excited about is not only do we have a strategy operating in this space with new data and new resources, we're finally trying to bend the technology cost curve on resilience. How do we deploy AI and machine learning on satellites to help us pinpoint where poor vegetation management is going to disrupt the grid? That's something we can do. How do we help our firefighters who are on the front lines of fires that are burning more furiously than ever before take on that challenge with new tools, not the ones they've been using for the last many decades? How do we help communities who wanna harden and protect their infrastructure in the face of the next hurricane and the next storm do it in a more effective, cost-effective and efficacious way? The game changers that we've identified, I'd encourage you to go look at and think about how you might plug in to helping us innovate on the resilience technologies that we need to meet this moment. Now, I started with the very heavy reality that so many of us inherit. I was actually born the year that for the first time on Mount Mauna Loa, they marked 350 parts per million. So my story is like everyone else's over the last several decades, a world that's watched the atmospheric concentration of CO2 creep up and the damage and the destruction, the fierceness and the fury of the next storm and the next impact be more extreme and more catastrophic. There's a lot of doom and gloom to go around, but there's also a lot of hope and opportunity. You all are young, but the folks that are signing up to the American Climate Corps in many cases are even younger. And they've decided to respond to this first ever call for this first ever American Climate Corps in a fashion that I would never have anticipated. We've got 15,000 young people who've signed up and are on the ground already just since Earth Day. And by the end of this year, we will have met the president's goal of deploying 20,000 young people into the American Climate Corps. And for those keeping track at, at home who, and I don't mean this in a pejorative way, that's twice as big as the Peace Corps in just the first year. So think about the boundlessness of the hope, of the hope and optimism that young people even younger than you are bringing to this, at least for me, that is a cue that we cannot indulge in the doom and gloom. We've got to lean in to the opportunity and get the job done. And the good news, and we'll talk about this with my dear friend, Tiernan Sittenfeld, who is really at the front lines of shaping the political economy around climate action. She's a big reason why we were able to pass the Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and do all of the things I described because civil society plays such an integral role in what the public sector is able to accomplish. The good news is this, those young people, that story of hope and possibilities, that's translating not just to steel in the ground, but into a durability around the politics of climate action. And my assessment, just take this as one person's read, but maybe someone who's spent a lot of time thinking about it, the politics of climate inaction are unambiguously deteriorated. That's the good news. We gotta get the job done though. Thank you. Thank you all for that. And thank you, Mr. Zaid. Oh, my gosh, I just, I didn't know about the um, Climate Corps. I should know about that and I hadn't. And so I'm absolutely thrilled because I was thinking that was what we needed and it's already on its way. Um, 
we're going to have a little bit of a conversation now. And again, if you had questions and you wanted to send them to the edge, uh, please go ahead and do that. And we'll have them picked up by some folks. But as we are sitting, both of you, as we're sitting in an auditorium at an institution of higher education, may I, and you, you've spoken to this in a few different meetings today, but may I ask you both what you see as the, the skills, the knowledge, and the vision that we as a higher ed could be giving and helping next generation climate leaders to have as they enter this workforce, this space. And, you know, as an act, in, in, in addition to that, will there be jobs in these areas? Can they be competitive and ready to lead and take those roles? So first, what should we, what should we be giving them? And second, are there spaces for them? Well, thank you so much, Dr. Perkins, and thank you, Professor Ogden. I know I saw you on the way in, and thanks to the whole team here at Dartmouth. It is so great to be back. I was at sort of nascent, got an environmental studies certificate when I was here decades ago. So to see how far Dartmouth has come, how much Dartmouth is leading, the opportunity for Dartmouth to really set an example and to inspire and help other universities make so much progress is really just makes me so proud as a Dartmouth alum. So thank you for the opportunity to be here. Obviously, thank you to Ali and to his colleague, Diego, and to the rest of his team who are not here. I mean, I'm feeling so much hope and possibility. Of course, I always feel that way when I listen to Ali talk and when we chat and conspire about how to make more progress. But truly, I mean, we are at such an amazing moment. And I think it is th thanks so much to young people and to organizers, to activists, to advocates, to communicators across the country who came together at this moment in the run up to 2021 when we finally had this opportunity, this pro-climate, pro-democracy trifecta, um, sort of narrow and transient as it may be to, but hopefully not, fighting for lots more progress because our future is depending on it, um, but to really come together to have this incredible, diverse, inclusive, powerful coalition. We learned from past mistakes that were too insidery, that were too like inside the DC bubble, spending so much time on the perfect policy when a lot of the policy solutions are clear. What we need to do is to build the political will. And we have gotten to the point, I think, to go even a little further into what Ali said is that it is clear that acting on climate and clean energy and environmental and racial justice and doing so in a way that centers good paying family sustaining union jobs is both good policy and good politics. It is the right thing to do. And we need to make sure that success begets success. But for all the students um, in the room, I think absolutely there is a future for you. I'm, I think having graduated from Dartmouth in 1996 and spent my career first as an organizer and then doing more inside the beltway environmental advocacy, we have learned a lot from past mistakes. We have become a more effective and more powerful movement. We have started to make progress at the scale that science and justice require. And you know, as we're seeing with the devastation, first of Helene and now with Milton, we, we have so much more work to do. So I would love to, as, your, as an alum, I would love to talk with any of you offline about opportunities, but whether it's advocacy, whether it's communicating, whether it's being in civil society, working on Capitol Hill, working in the administration, state government, local government. There are so many opportunities and we haven't even talked about great opportunities in the private sector, but I'm gonna stop there because there's just, there's, there's so much. Yeah, we need every discipline in every sector of the economy. Um, I've been fortunate to be part of um, getting deals done to buy and sell uh, in this space to, invest new private capital into scaling up clean energy firms. That's a place where we need smart folks uh, who are uh, writing to the right set of risks and opportunities. Um, we need it in the hard tech arenas. Uh, when you think about something like industrial decarbonization, um, steel, cement, aluminum, we don't have all the answers. We frankly don't even have the economics and the policy architecture to ensure that we're making progress at the pace we need to. Um, we need all of what the social sciences have to offer. One of the things uh, that I think Dartmouth is so uh, such a leader on is the integration of indigenous knowledge and making sure that that is a central part of so much of what you do. When you think about nature and who manages it, um, you have indigenous communities really uh, at the frontier, both of the impacts of 
uh, climate on our natural systems, but also on the tremendous resource they present uh, to be able to breathe in the gunk that we put into the sky. How do we center a system around them, not around the traders in Wall Street, but around the indigenous communities who stand to gain if we manage our resources better uh, and compensate for the benefit that they bring? And uh, you know, to maybe take even sort of the broader brush on uh, the advocacy piece that Tiernan laid out, I think we need desperately in this country more and new narratives around climate. Um, we need to engage the broadest set of folks and we need to help them build an intuition so that when misinformation floods in, uh, folks know that it's not on the level because they have a baseline. And that's not just gonna be, you know, as much as I love science and nature and publications that are peer reviewed, it's going to come as much through the pages of that as the pages of the New Yorker. It's going to come as much through that as it's going to come through the next thing that you're binging on on Netflix. And I think that's an important part of uh, the mobilization is, is folks finding themselves in this national mission that we have, regardless of the thing that excites you from a tactical perspective. Can I add just one specific thing to that? We were very lucky at LCV to have an amazing Dartmouth student, Ben Stevenson, who's here. Um, yes, big applause for Ben. But <laughs> Ben worked with us on implementation of the Inflation Reduction Act this summer, was actually doing research about the very specific benefits to share with members of Congress so they could educate their constituents about how they could save money, literally putting cash back in their pockets, doing all these great things to their homes, getting the heat pump, having better access to a more affordable EV. Um, he's done a fact sheet about how Dartmouth is benefiting from the Inflation Reduction Act. So my point is, both that Ben is fantastic, but also that it's not too soon for everyone in this room. There is so much as students and early in your career that you can do to really help to change this narrative and to build the clean energy future that we all um, so desperately need and deserve and that is underway, but we got to pick up the pace. Thank you. So what I'm hearing is we need to just keep doing, we need to let you know it's out there and that all of the skills that you bring that you get in every class can be climate action skills. So please keep keep thinking of yourselves as part of the solution. Thank you. Um, and then for the two of you, how do you uh, construct, this is for the broader society, how do you construct the case for climate action and the coalitions we need across civil society? For example, you know, how do you get into American manufacturing and address the dual challenge of both job creation and climate change mitigation and make that a narrative that is capturing people's hearts and minds and actions? I think for too long, there was sort of a narrative which maybe speaks to some of the misinformation, which in some ways, as we've been more effective in ratcheting up and making progress at the scale that we need to, the misinformation and the sheer amount of, and the volume of misinformation coming from the fossil fuel industry and the amount of money they're willing to spend to spread misinformation means that we all really need to ratchet up our efforts. But for too long, there was sort of a false narrative or a false choice of like, you have to choose between a healthy environment and a robust economy. And we absolutely know a healthy democracy, a healthy environment, a healthy climate, a healthy economy, healthy and strong national security, all of them go hand in hand. And I think by building this coalition that again, so much credit to young people who really pushed, especially coming out of the 2018 elections that climate, op climate action is not optional, that failure is absolutely not an option, that we have to make progress, but the combination of environmental organizations, listening and learning and doing work differently, listening and being led by environmental justice leaders, working in close collaboration with labor unions, with the private sector, with state and local government, all has had a big impact. And when we've started to really see that progress, but again, so much more to do. And that's what I'm so excited about. Yeah. I mean, look, I think that um, the, the economic piece of this is so central. Um, Tiernan noted the, the um, tactics deployed to slow down climate action. 
And it used to be just straight up climate denial. And that's a little hard to do now. Um, so instead, in its place, there's skepticism about the solutions. There's questioning about the impact on the economy. And there's also, I think, a surge of cynicism that any of us could do anything about it. And I think what we've proven over the last three and a half years is actually, if we all get together, we can do something very big about it, doubled our pace of decarbonization and set up the conditions to double it again. And that, in fact, this is the thing that's going to bring about the American economic revival that we've been chasing for decades. You know, we have trickle down economics, unstructured tax cuts for billionaires. That has not brought about a manufacturing renaissance. Ironically, for the haters, what's brought about the American manufacturing renaissance is the thing they were railing against and pretending didn't exist. We've leaned into that economic opportunity and we have the factory floors as receipts. Uh, thank you. I have uh, one, yeah, one, one I wanted to mention because, of course, we're all looking at our phones and if we have family uh, down south right now um, in near in Florida, we know that the hurricane is hitting and it's one of the worst in, in, in history. And we are fairly sure we know that these are all, all connected. Climate change, um, it has increased the, the, the energy of our, in, in the, of our storms and of the damage they they give to communities and take lives. So as this intensifies, you build these coalitions, we get trained up, but what can, what is, is there enough being done now? And what can we do in the future to make sure that we have the infrastructure and resilient strategies we need? And I'll say at the federal and state levels, and these are probably some big questions, but to ensure we do protect communities and sustain local economies, in the face of rapid climate change, as we know, no, even as we're working hard to mitigate and adapt and, and, low, and lower carbon, it's still gonna move forward. We're going to have increasing heat. We may not hit one point, we may not be able to get to our 1.5. So with increasing storms, what, what now do we do to both you know, try to fix this, but also manage what we have? What kind of investments are so important right now? So look, we invested $50 billion through the last infrastructure law into resilience. Uh, and one of the things that I'm really proud of is that it really takes on the, the breadth of the threats. Uh, so for the first time, we're thinking about how do you build out the cooling centers, uh, the canopy, the strategic assets that will help um, combat the urban heat island effect um, and the temperatures that are threatening um, now thousands of lives uh, just last year, uh, getting people pushed into the ER, uh, taking on drought. Uh, we had uh, the driest uh, season out West in a thousand years, the year we passed the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, we've been able to stabilize the situation for a few years, not for the long run, but stabilize the situation because of the investments in the Inflation Reduction Act. Coastal resilience is something we've started to learn how to do better, but it's not um, anywhere near complete. Um, for example, we're building cocoons around uh, hospitals uh, so that category four hurricanes don't knock out the most uh, critical facilities that we have, but we've got to bend the curve on how much it costs to do that and get it out uh, and have it be more ubiquitous. Our electricity grid is starting to catch up. We've made massive upgrades in places like Louisiana, so floods don't knock out substations that knock out then every other critical service. But there's a long way to go. I think the reality is we are probably in need of an order of magnitude or more greater investment into resilience. What we did, I think, has helped prime communities to prioritize this, to build some capacity to think about it, to build plans, but they presented us with their plans and we've run out of cash every single time in helping them get the resources that they need to build this. So, you know, Congress in 26 and beyond has to come back 
to the question of infrastructure. Um, I hope they come back and they go even bigger, huge on the question of resilience, because this is going to keep happening. This is our new normal. Uh, the question is not whether this is our new normal or not. The question is whether it gets worse. And that's why we attack the root cause, which is the greenhouse gas emissions going into our atmosphere. Totally agree with everything Ali said, of course. And we talked about this earlier. I mean, the amount of misinformation specifically in the last you know, 10 days is just staggering and so terrifying around all of this. And so I think it is incumbent upon all of us to be as educated as possible, to have the facts, to be able to communicate to our our friends, our neighbors, our family, um, because I think having that sort of communicating to people who you trust and who trust you is one of the things that's going to be especially necessary as we all work to make sure that the truth is out there. Thank you. Um, I, you know, we are sitting in the, in a, a center for international understanding. I, I work in the Arctic where climate is three to four times, climate change is three to four times as rapid. People are at the front lines of this. We're talking about a hurricanes happening. And this, as climate has no borders, it is around the world. So how is the U.S., I'm really interested in how um, you think the U.S. with these federal policies, with the pushes that you've talked about, is collaborating or working or leading internationally to accelerate global climate action? And what opportunities exist for us to, you know, to, for the United States and federal policy and implementation to advance economic growth, environmental stewardship in these partnerships um, with others and learn from others? What are you seeing internationally as our role? We're the central participant in these conversations. Um, when the United States left the Paris Agreement during the Trump administration, we sidelined all of our workers in a global clean energy race. We also set back the global conversation on how we take on these challenges. Um, and I, you know, I think we've made up a lot of ground uh, over the last three and a half years. One place where I feel really good about the progress we're making is around super pollutants, uh, which contribute uh, to probably half of the warming we're seeing right now. Things like methane, N2O, um, hydrofluorocarbons, uh, the world came together around Kigali, which is, by the way, people say, oh, have you passed anything since the Inflation Reduction Act? Actually, just two months later, we passed the first environmental treaty through the United States Senate to ratify the Kigali Amendment. Um, the U.S. commitment there uh, has, I think, helped shore up the world's trajectory in phasing out HFCs. That's a really big deal. Um, Methane, the president made a big play for that here in the United States, set a very robust domestic strategy. At Glasgow, he had about 50 countries that signed on to his methane pledge. Now we have 150 countries. China has committed to putting methane in their nationally determined contribution. That only happens because the U.S. is leading and leaning in. Now, that's not to say that we have the job done. Uh, when we were going into Paris, the 2015 climate negotiations. On the high end, the estimates were that the world was on a seven to eight degree warming trajectory. Uh, today, we're at something like two, two and a half by the same folks who make the estimates. Some say three. Let's say three. If we went from seven to three because of multilateral engagement, that means we've got a playbook that works. So we've got to keep ratcheting that. And I think a big part of that is making sure China comes to the table in a very real way and does the hard work of decarbonizing. They have um, rapidly been increasing per capita emissions in a way that now parallels places like the EU. Um, that's, I think, a signal that they need to approach this challenge in a very different way. They're going to be the world's leading emitter. Um, uh, in a, you know, in a matter of years. So that's, I think it's a big piece. I think the third thing is making sure more countries can download the IRA playlist, build the manufacturing capacity, tap into the economic opportunity, whether it's in nature-based solutions or otherwise. And it's on us to bring the development aid and the development finance, both through our agencies and through World Bank reform to get the job done there. I would just add, the world is watching. The world watched 
when the U.S. pulled out of the Paris Climate Agreement and countries around the world were horrified. The world watched when Ali and others across the administration led the charge in working with Congress and getting the biggest thing the world has ever seen on climate and environmental justice and clean energy, the Inflation Reduction Act, done. That sent a huge, huge message and boost of optimism around the world. All of the executive action on cars and trucks and methane and so much more that Ali has been leading on, that is instrumental and so impactful. The world is also watching. We have elections in 27 days. We have to continue the progress of the Biden-Harris administration. We know the other person running pulled us out of Paris and wants to drill, drill, drill and be a dictator. I don't want to get political, but those those are all public facts. To, to also to just end on a more positive note with that question, I'm still grateful to the Dickey Center for a grant that I got the summer before my senior year at Dartmouth to volunteer at an orphanage in Tegucigalpa, Honduras. It was a really incredible experience. Thank you. And we still have all sorts of opportunities for all of you. I wanted to ask if we had a few cards that I'll, I'll take from you. So more than a few, more than a few. I, I will, I will be selective um, for time for folks. Thank you. Um, and one of them here is, well, actually it dovetails just on what we were just talking about. And you talked about this a little bit in some of the other conversations today. Um, so in a next administration, what might be the differences between moving forward with what we, what, what you are talking about now or, uh, different policies, what could survive? What of what is being done now for climate action, can it survive without that federal leadership? Um, and, uh, and how should we frame climate action? Um, is it despair if there's not a climate leader in the White House or are there other things that are just going to continue happening? What is your thinking about the future of climate action almost regardless of the presidential administration knowing the different politics that might be in play right now? Um, well, I, I won't, I definitely won't speak to the election uh, or, or to the campaign. I, I will. Tiernan can. Um, uh, I, I stand by the, the last slide I presented, which uh, I believe firmly that the politics of climate inaction are deteriorating. And the reason is because of what we're seeing even in Congress right now. So they've taken about 50 votes in the House, led by House Republicans, to try to roll back parts of the Inflation Reduction Act, other parts of our climate agenda. They failed every single time to get that over the line uh, and into law. And just a few weeks ago, you had a dozen and a half House Republicans write to their leader and say, hey, maybe we should give up on this part of our agenda because it doesn't seem to be taking. Um, I think there's a reason for that. And it goes back to the economics driving the political economy. Um, when steel goes in the ground, factories turn back on, people sign up for jobs. It's really hard to pull the rug out from underneath that. So I think there's a real durability to the work we've done, but we're to go back now to my first slide. We are in the decisive decade for climate action. It's halftime. And while we've been putting a lot of points on the board, we have not won the game. We're probably losing the game relative to the scientific clock, depending on how you assess it. And so in what world does it make sense to say, all right, let's go off the court or let's just, you know, keep doing what we're doing if you're, un if you're, if you're underwater in terms of score. So the challenge is not whether the progress we've made is durable or not. The challenge is we got to figure out a way to go a lot faster and make up that remaining ground in a shorter period of time. And that's where leadership and additional public policy leadership comes in. I agree with Ali um, what he said. We've been canvassing in states around the country, give, giving out these brochures, again, telling people about the benefits and across all demographics, people are really excited. The benefits, which are largely building up in redder parts of the country are very popular. And there is increasingly you know, a, a real desire to keep this in place regardless of what happens with the elections. That said, at the League of Conservation Voters, we often point out that elections have consequences and the consequences will be massive. Hopefully we will continue to have Vice President Harris who has worked hand in glove with President Biden to make historic progress with their amazing team and this whole of government approach they brought since day one. 
but the contrast between her and her opponent really could not be greater. The stakes obviously couldn't be higher. And, you know, as we've been talking about and keeping everyone in Florida um, in our hearts, the, the need for more progress couldn't be more urgent. So we have got to build on the progress. We have to keep going forward and making more progress. Thank you. Um, so many of these questions, I'm trying to figure out how to maybe connect them all, but there is a, a real core to them that goes to a lot of the work, um, a lot of the discussions you had in your in your presentation. Um, and I, it's wonderful to see them so, so popped out in these questions about how with all of this work, um, and it's, you're gonna get to reiterate, I think some of the work you've done, how you center and think about uh, communities that are often disadvantaged in these conversations, local communities versus sort of federal mandates. And then a question specifically, someone pointed out that um, uh, Department of Interior Secretary uh, Deb Holland was in one of your slides. And so how, do, how, do, how does the federal government think about this climate action centering indigenous communities and tribal lands? So the idea that there are these, again, you mentioned this in your slides, there's these big pushes for change and yet there are these voices and, and to be centered and thought, how, how, do we do, how do you do that and how can we help do that in the future? So a few tactics that we've deployed that I think have been really successful. Um, the first is putting your money where your mouth is. Um, so we have coded into the tax credits a benefit if you deploy the capital in disadvantaged communities, in tribal communities and in low-income communities and in communities that have seen a loss of jobs. And just to be very specific, if you're building a hundred million dollar solar project you get a $30 million tax credit if you deploy in a community that does not have these challenges. And you get a $40 million tax credit if you do. That's real money. That is an actual incentive. And we're seeing it play out in the market where 78% of the deployment of clean energy, thanks to the IRA, has been in communities that have uh, seen some of these challenges historically. So that's thing number one, and that's pretty important. Um, the second big thing is making sure that we're empowering the communities themselves to write the next chapter of their story. Um, it's not uh, when you have been disenfranchised from economic opportunity uh, and the democratic process for big parts of America's history, um, if someone shows up with good news and you are once again left out of the decision-making process, that's a big problem. Uh, so one of the exciting parts of the Inflation Reduction Act is um, a set of grants called the Climate Pollution Reduction Grants, which go to communities to build and expand their capacity to draft up their own climate pollution plans and deploy the capital as they want to. We've got environmental justice technical assistance grants that's just to help folks measure and monitor so that they can do the work to attract the capital. And then we're making sure that the formation of capital is also democratic and has equity in mind. So, you know, you got JP Morgan and Citibank and others who are moving money in this space, but they are likely to run where they have normally run. That's why we've capitalized a new set of national green banks with $27 billion that's now attracted 100 plus billion of additional capital. So $125, $150 billion specifically deploying through community development banks, uh, especially community development banks run by uh, minority communities. So that's, uh, you, gotta, you gotta move the money, you gotta build the capacity and you got to bring people into the decision-making process. I think that's the only way you live up to it. And then you've got to have accountability on the back end, which is what the Justice 40 initiative and the map I was referring to is all about. I'm really glad that it sounds like you got numerous questions, um, which is important because for far too long, this was not enough of a priority or even was sort of overlooked, including by big national environmental organizations. And I would say the League of Conservation Voters where I work has been really privileged to be able to learn a lot from environmental justice leaders over the last several years. We're very proud founding members of something called 
the Equitable and Just National Climate Platform. Um, you can find it online, but it's you know, really incredible and helped inform a lot of first the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis, which is led by a real climate champion from Florida, um, Kathy Castor. This was in the previous Congress, but that helped inform a lot of what the Biden-Harris administration did that became Build Back Better and then the Inflation Reduction Act that does center environmental and racial justice that focuses on the communities that have been hit first and worst, not just by the climate crisis, but by toxic pollution in their communities for decades. So we are starting to make progress. Everything that Ali said is so important and there's a lot more to do, which is why we have to keep going forward. I can't think of a better way to uh, end this and say, thank you all for your questions and your thoughtfulness. Thank you for my incredible answers. And I, I've just been blown away all day and I have so much to think about. Um, I wanna thank co-sponsors of this event, just so you know, the Climate Futures Initiative. Thank you, uh, Professor Ogden and the Environmental Studies Department who I also got a partial degree from, from my graduate degree. So we're, it's all in the background. Um, you know, we have an incredible community here at Dartmouth uh, we are so proud to attract speakers such as you to share your knowledge with us, and we hope you will be back. And we keep, you know, I can't thank you enough for the work you are doing and your teams. And uh, this climate action, yes, we're not, it's not fast enough. So we have to move as much as we can. And we need all of you in all of your disciplines to help as well. Thank you for being here. Have a wonderful evening. Take good care. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all.